Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this educational cooking show. Today we are featuring Chef Michael Hintzman of Punningham Grill, located in Chestnut Hill. He and my co-host Joe Murphy will be making three dishes. They'll start off with the Mediterranean pita, tomato bisque, and pan seared scallops served over tiger shrimp risotto. Cannot wait to taste that. And later on we'll have a wine pairing and I will be visiting Puttingham Grill to talk to Michael more about his signature dishes. So let's bring Joe and Michael over to learn how to make the three dishes. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy, co-host of the Chef's Table series. This show was produced by the Chef's Table Foundation, which was created to produce the show, but our ultimate objective is to support U.S. homeless veterans and underprivileged homeless young adults with at least a high school or GED equivalency. And we're very, very pleased today to have a wonderful restaurant from Brookline. We try to shoot at least one restaurant in each town that we air the show in. So I'm sure that cycle's going to be close to a year and three months because we're up to 58 towns and cities weekly now. But having said that, tonight it's about the Putterham Grill. We have a wonderful chef, and his name is Chef Michael Hintzman. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for coming, Michael. Thank you for having me, Joe. Yeah, Chef has put together an extraordinary menu, and it's based on Middle Eastern cuisine. Mediter yes, Mediterranean of sorts. Right? Oh, I'm a Mediterranean sorry, Mediterranean. Restaurant right. with a concentration yeah. in Greek cuisine in particular. Excellent. But we yeah. do everything, a little bit of everything, Joe. Yeah, that's great. Now, uh, we will be doing, you know, the interview at the restaurant as well, so Carol, you know, will show your interior and do all of that, and she has other questions, but what I'm going to do is just keep in mind that this show is designed to be instructional, so Chef will be giving you some great tips, so pay attention, and I'll try to let you know when I think if he does give you a great tip, which I expect, uh, you know, that you should take note, all right? Now, mise en place. Every show we talk about mise en place. And mise en place is a French term. It means everything in its place. So that when you start your cooking, you want to have every, all your ingredients laid out so that you're not running around at a critical moment and then say, oh my God, I forgot the allspice, I forgot the cinnamon, or whatever it is you may have left out. And it also eliminates uh, not having a key ingredient because it's there in front of you. So mise en place. All right, chef, why don't we talk about your mise en place? What do you have there? This is your first dish, correct? Yes, sir. This, okay. is, the, this is the first dish, Joe. All right. Well, here we have, uh, it's a homemade pita bread. It's a Greek-style grilled pita bread, which I've made myself. However, if you like any store-bought flatbread will do. If you yeah. have a char grill available at home, you can mm -hmm. just mark it on the grill for the effect that it creates yeah. a nice flavor as well. <laughs> what I've done here is I've toasted it in the oven yeah. at 350 degrees for about five or six minutes. Right. It's slightly crisp, but it's not brittle. You don't want to overcook your pita bread because that's going to make it a little bit unpleasant right. uh, you know, for, the, for the consumer. Sure. Now, on top of this pita is going to go what I call a chickpea cucumber puree. Mm. And the first part is strained Greek yogurt with shredded English cucumber, a little bit of fresh lemon juice, salt and pepper, mm. and extra virgin olive oil. Wow. Alongside, we have a chickpea puree as well, which is pureed chickpeas. Once again, extra virgin Greek olive oil, a little bit of fresh lemon juice, salt and pepper. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine uh, these two ingredients yeah, to I'm make the chickpea you, cucumber the, puree. The, the aromas just from this... You know, this dish is just fabulous. I'm well, loving the smell. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I tell you, that's what we're all about at the Putterham Grill. We use nothing but the highest quality ingredients. We Good. keep everything tremendously fresh. 
and we're not afraid to get creative either. So yeah. you never know what you're going to encounter when you walk through the door. Right. That's great. So are you using a lot of sustainable products? Oh, absolutely. That, 100%. Yes, yeah. sir. And you source locally, particularly in season for produce? I utilize local purveyors whenever possible. Yeah. And that's really, to me, a sign of a great restaurant. You know you're getting the freshest possible in the highest quality. So that, that's good to hear. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Okay, so you have your... The chickpea puree and the right. cucumber puree as well. I'm just going to mix them together. It's not a right. big process, not a yeah. big step. All the flavors are already there. All the work is already done for the most part. Okay. Now, when you uh, puree your chickpeas, yes. do you add... What do you add to that? Anything? Garlic, salt, pepper? A little bit of, little bit of fresh garlic, yeah. extra virgin olive oil, fresh right. squeezed lemon juice, and just a drop of water as well to helps in the process of pureeing. Yes, yeah. otherwise it may bind up in your machine and be okay. a little bit difficult. Okay, so Chef just gave you a tip. You know, it's not hard to puree if you have a food processor, but he just gave you a tip. Don't be afraid to add a little bit of water, all right? Do it depending on your quantity. Don't over add the water, so I suggest use a tablespoon, a teaspoon, and just add until you get to the right consistency. Yes, sir. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to place this on top of our toasted pizza bread. Right. Not too much. Yeah. It's almost like as if you're making a pizza. Yeah. You want to spread it evenly, mm -hmm. and you want to leave a little bit of space right around the edge, just so whoever's enjoying it can grab it without getting their fingers too dirty. Good. And that's all right right there. I'm just going to oh, rest yeah. this behind us, Joe. Now, Chef also gave you a tip on the pita bread, and I'm impressed you're making your own flatbread yes. here. And again, you don't want that crunchy toasted because if, when you go to bite it, you're going to have it all over the front of you, I would exactly. think. So, okay. Well, next we have what I call a demi horiatiki salad. And a horiatiki salad is a traditional Greek village salad, which is oh, comprised cool. of tomatoes, cucumbers, bell pepper. And in this case, I've added Kalamata olive and pepperoncini as well. Nice. We nice. mix, yes, yes. Yeah, if I can just look at that. Now, this is a very, well, it's a fine dice. It's yeah. a small dice. I think, that, I think we call that a, somewhat of a brunoise, yes, Joe? Yeah, yeah, which is? Uh, a brunoise is a culinary term which describes a particular cut on a vegetable, a piece of meat, pretty much anything that you're cutting. And yeah. it's roughly two centimeters by two centimeters. It's a square piece. Right. Very nice. Yes. Smell, uh, I'm telling you. The, Thank you. Fresh, fresh, yeah, fresh I, vegetables. I the olive oil. some of this right now. We use only Greek feta cheese as well, which is everybody knows is the world's best. best. Yes, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So we take our horatiki salad and we just place it atop yeah. the pita bread, which already has our cucumber puree spread across. And then we just apply it liberally. We want to cover the puree yeah. for the most part. You don't want to go too heavy. I think this is just the right amount. That's perfect right yeah. there. That's, that's a great appetizer, isn't it? Oh, I tell you, I tell you what, it's, 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 it's cost efficient, it's time efficient as well. I mean, let's just say we had a, a working mother coming home looking to put something on the table for yeah. the family, maybe uh, some soup and a sandwich and a, and a nice appetizer. The, the, yeah. You can get this on the table within 10 to 15 minutes yeah. from the time you start production. Yeah, it's and you know, you just, yes. it, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, if you wanted the soup and salad, you could do that as a roll-up. Yes. I mean, I, I could... Uh, the that would go, well, that would go wonderful. Maybe with some grilled chicken. Oh, uh, yeah. That would be fantastic yeah. show, huh? Maybe some other time we'll do yeah. that. Yeah. If you take a night off, I'll come over the house for dinner. Love to have it. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Great. That looks great. Well, thank you. All right. Now, uh, what is this? Is this... This feta? is some imported feta cheese as oh, well. Sweet. And there's, there's, there is no comparison between a nice imported Greek feta and the standard domestic feta, which is available. If you, right. if you go to a specialty market, then they should be able to provide Yeah. And this. even a yes. lot of your supermarkets now have specialty cheese section so you can get it there but you know chef just gave you another great tip if you want the real thing and you know when you get into mediterranean cooking fresh 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 says it all and you know if you can get the imported products it really makes a difference it does it does yeah. okay so i'm just going to sprinkle this a little bit on the top have my clean glove on here there we go I'm just going to cut it into wedges. I like to cut about six pieces yeah. per pizza. Just, it allows for a nice portion. The consumer can pick it up right. and they can enjoy it. You know, I, I've been watching. There's a certain national pizza company, and they do a pretzel pizza. 
I don't know if you've seen pretzel pizza. That sounds wonderful. I'm familiar with the pretzel bun. Yeah. However, well, I have not encountered I, I don't pretzel know, pizza me, as of yet. You know, I love your regular pizza. Yes. I don't mind pepperoni, mushrooms, but you know, pe they're doing some outrageous things with pizza. But this is a great Thank pizza you. option. Thank I, I love this. And you know, if you're having, say, friends, family over, and you're not going to serve dinner, this is a great, great appetizer yes. type or, uh, you know, a nice little tasting. So yes. it'd be great to use. It's a great holiday item as well. Thank you, Joey. It now, is. do you make this year round? Yes, I do. I make, I make the dough myself, as a matter of great. fact. Standard yeast dough, which wow. we stretch on the grill. Yeah. I finish off in a convection oven. And as a matter of fact, we also make a very nice pizza, an actual pizza at the Putterham Grill. Really? I'll make you anything from a cheese or a pepperoni, uh, maybe a sausage and caramelized onion to Por sa sauteed portobello mushroom, wow. baby spinach, crumbled goat cheese, maybe right. a little bit of white truffle as well. Excellent. Um, yes, yes. That, and that's the, gr I love a grilled pizza. I like that little bit of, of caramelization on the dough. Yes. And, you know, this is great. Well, why don't we get, I'll go, get you a plate, oh, you plate nice. this, and we can set this and get on to the next dish. Fantastic. That sound Sounds good, good Joe. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Get the plate. All right, here you go, chef. Wonderful. Here we go. I got to tell you, folks. This smells like I want to jump in and start eating. Thank you, Joe. It, 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 and I'm, I'm very sincere about that, just the aromas of, of all these ingredients. And you can tell that it's fresh, it's imported, you know, just great. And there we go, Joe. There's a nice Mediterranean pizza ready to enjoy. Uh, excellent. Very good. All right. So, Chef, what is your next course? Well, we have a roasted tomato bisque coming Ooh, up next, Joe. Nice. It's a wonderful tomato soup. You know, the Mediterranean cuisine is generally delicate, and, and but full of flavor. I, I just love it. I'm, I'm guessing you do a lamb shank? A tremendous lamb shank. Oh, my God. Stewed carrot, tomato cinnamon reduction. I serve that over a truffled risotto of portobello mushroom and caramelized onion. Oh. When I tell you the flavor is just fantastic, it comes right can off the I, bone. Can I come home mouth. tonight? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, you, I love lamb shank. You have to speak to Gwen about that. It's my oh. wonderful girlfriend. Maybe oh, if she, right. she doesn't mind having you, Joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. Well, it was a platonic question. Course, there wasn't course, any, yes. any, <laughs> any, you know, We any have a large couch. In. Large oh, couch, okay, yes. Fine. Yes. All right, Chef. Here's the second mise en place, okay? I'm just going to clean up thank the board you, a little you, bit. Why don't you talk about uh, on this dish? Again, this is a tomato bisque. Yes, it's a roasted tomato bisque. And if I may, I have, I have a stock pot ready right back here for us. Okay. Yes, do we have a flame available to us, Joe? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So in the stock pot, we have a little bit of extra virgin olive oil yeah. and some unsalted butter. Yeah. Mass Joe, in your, in your practice, in your kitchen, do you use a salted or an unsalted butter? You know what? You're talking to the preacher. Every show, I, I bring this up. In a commercial bakery or a commercial professional kitchen, never salted butter, okay? Always unsalted. So I'm glad you brought that up because Chef here has a square piece of butter. So this was not from a quartered uh, pound of butter, yes. okay? The water content is much less. So you're getting more solids, more real butter. So I always recommend get the solid pounds of butter, okay? You're not gonna buy a 50 pound block or 60 pound block, but don't be afraid to get the block. You're gonna have more real butter product. All right, Chef, sorry. So, to, oh, please don't be sorry. To, so to this butter and oil mixture, we're going to add some red onion or Bermuda onion. It can be sliced, it can be diced. It really doesn't matter because we're going to puree everything Sweet. when all is said and done. Yeah. Now, you just want to cook the onion for the matter of about a minute or so. You just want to start the cooking process right. until it starts to soften and become slightly translucent. Okay. You don't really want to caramelize the onion at this stage because that's going to detract from any flavor, which right. comes to the dish later yeah, on. Yeah, and Chef just gave you another great tip. Do not caramelize, you know, that translucent look. You know, red onion is not a very gassy onion as opposed to a big white yellow onion, 
where you may want to cook that a little bit longer and cook off the gases and the acids and the stuff that makes you want to cry. So keep that in mind. You just want to translucent, do not caramelize on this dish. Yes, hopefully tears of joy will be the only thing coming from soon as I eat, eyes on this. We're done. I'll be happy. Indeed. And so to the, to the slightly cooked onion, we're going to add a brown sugar braised plum tomato. Wow. So I just take a plum tomato filet with a little yes. bit of tomato juice here, right. to which I've already added a little bit of light brown sugar right. and some ground allspice. It just helps with the, with the flavor. And when I bake these tomatoes in the oven, oh. I use a sheet pan yeah. on which I place some aluminum foil. Just makes cleanup a little bit easier for yeah. you. Okay. And I roast okay. that in the oven about, once again, 350 degrees, right. just until, until the tomato starts to caramelize slightly on top. Not, not too more. Then you want to set it off to the yeah. side. I, I've used that technique myself, but if you want to make a home sun-dried tomato, you can bake these plump tomatoes at a very slow oven and they will dry down but it will still have a nice texture to it, exactly. as opposed to the jarred ones where you can get, have to yeah, chew a little like bit. That, yeah. Now, I have a quick question. Oh, please. O on these tomatoes, yes. you blanch them first and then peel them, or are these canned? I create a tomato concasse, so yes. As a matter of fact, I, I make an X-shaped incision yeah. on the bottom of the plum tomato, and then I okay. put them in boiling water for about 60 seconds, Joe. Is that right. your practice? Yeah. Then we transfer them to a bowl of ice water, ice water at yeah. which point the skin just naturally peels away. Peels and it's right just a away. Wonder, wonderful process. It's, fan right. it's fantastic. Okay, and then you bake them on a sheet pan with brown sugar. A little bit of brown sugar and olive oil, right. just a pinch of allspice as well. It's a nice, nice it's flavor. An, yes, a nice yeah, flavor. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Wow. So okay. at this point, Joe, I'm going to add just a small amount of tomato paste. It just helps to build the tomato flavor right. for us right here. Yeah. I love tomato. I just, too. It's actually a citrus fruit. A lot of folks don't know that the tomato is classified as a citrus fruit. Is that right? Plenty of vitamin C, yes. Good. And we stir it around. Get everything mixed up. Now, at this point, I'm going to add some all-purpose white flour. Now, do you recall how we had the butter and the oil? Yeah. Now, let me ask you, do, can you do, are you familiar with a, a term called roux, Joe, sure. by chance? Can yeah. you tell the, the folks what, the, what a roux is? Yeah, a, a roux is a base for sauces or it's a thickening agent. Generally, uh, you know, there are different levels. The longer you cook it, obviously, with the butter, it's going to get browner. But what you're really doing is cooking that flour taste out but you're also giving it color. Now, if you let it go to a deep golden color, you're gonna start getting a nutty flavor. So be careful, you know, as to how long in this dish. I don't think you... More of a pale blonde roux we're going for yeah, here. More okay. of a pale blonde roux. And that'll help when, when, he, when he finishes, it'll help as a thickening agent, okay? So roux is, is butter and flour. Yes. All right, and there are other you could use cornstarch, but it doesn't work as good as flour. I don't think for a roux, but also you could use arrowroot, which is a little that bit too very expensive. Nice. Very, very nice, though. I yeah. like the arrowroot. Okay, great. So now I'm just going to add our all-purpose white flour. Yeah. Not, not too much. We had about a half a cup of liquid in there, so I'm going to add about a half a cup of flour. As roux is equal parts fat and flour. I, I prefer butter, and I'm sure Joe does as right. well. Yeah. Just a nice flavor. And we're just going to stir it around to make somewhat of a paste with our tomato filet, the tomato paste, oh. the butter, the oil, and the yeah. flour. Yeah. Oh, doesn't that look nice? Wonderful, wonderful. It smells aroma. even better Thank than you, it looking nice. Thank and, you very and, much. you know, you can get a look at how this thickened right it up. It all with comes this together. Roux. Now to this, I'm just going to add a simple vegetable stock. Excellent. Yes. So this is a great vegetarian dish if you're using a vegetable stock. And... Uh, it, yes, as, as a matter of fact, we, we have a variety of vegetarian and vegan options at the Putterham Grill. Oh, you as do? A I'm fact, glad you yes. mentioned that because I w did want to ask you that earlier. Just about two cups of the stock or the vegetable stock right. will suffice. Right. Now, you know, if, if you're lactose intolerant, this is a good way to get a nice tomato soup without adding milk. So, you know, to get that creamy type flavor yes. and the butter is certainly going to fortify and enrich the flavor. Indeed. Excellent. Indeed. Okay, chef. Now, as, as Joe said, if you are lactose intolerant or if you're just looking to steer clear of the dairy, you can leave it 
just like this. All you have right. to do is add the vegetable stock. And I like to simmer this for about 15 to 20 minutes yeah. just to let the flavors come together yeah. and combine. Right. At that point, I'm going to puree the soup. If we had a, a hand immersion blender right, right here, then we could utilize that, or just a, any type of a standard right. household kitchen blender will work as well, yeah. anything that you'd like. Right, I wish I brought my immersion blender. I have one that's good for home use, oh, really? and it would do this job. Or As you said, you could use a yes. food processor type blender or whatever, but you know, it, it almost looks like there was a cream or milk base in this with the color. Yes. And you're going to get plenty of flavor with those roasted that tomatoes again. and the allspice and the brown sugar, the red onions. C can I come home? Anytime, anytime. Gwen, Thank he's you. coming? Yes, he's yeah. coming. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Gwen. So, Chef, I know that you have a finished product there, but we're going to let this simmer. What do you recommend? I'd recommend roughly 15 to 20 minutes, Joe, just to let the flavors combine come together. Fully. Yes. Right. Now, on this particular soup, as I find, Soups are always even better the next day. Absolutely. You, I couldn't have said it better myself. Right. So here, if, if you would love to have something, the cold months are coming up, you can make this, if you have some leisure time on Sunday, just store this in the refrigerator and eat it during the week or take it Why to not? work with you. If you, want, you could even freeze it if you wanted to. Break right. it out and thaw it for a day and then you can reheat it and Excellent. come out just, just fine. Yeah. Well, that finished product looks great Chef. this is the finished product thank you very much Chef. yeah i can't wait for you to try it i'll just take a little taste mm, absolutely delicious thank you sir and the brown sugar and allspice exactly. really comes alive that's a great option if you do have a dietary restriction with dairy yes i mean it's absolutely delicious great job chef thank you very much Joe. okay so we're going to put that here, Yes. okay, as part of our finished products. And what's next? Well, next on the menu, we have a pan-seared sea scallop, which will be served over a tiger shrimp risotto with diced asparagus and sweet corn niblets. We're going to finish this dish with a creamed mm. lobster fumé and just a touch of aged balsamic and white truffle oil. It's a wonderful dish. The flavors are just really right. well combined. They're built on top of each other. I've been around uh, quite a few professional chefs, and for the most part, it's not like you see in these crazy television shows where the head chef is ready to knock your block off with a 10-inch saute pan. And the point I want to make is, talking to chef before this show, he's got a great personality. And, you know, it's really showing in the dishes that you're making. Thank you, Joe. Do, and I'm sure you don't have time. Do you go, have an opportunity to go out and talk to your guests? Or? As, a, as a matter of fact, when I, whenever, I, whenever I, I see someone uh, who I interact with and is, yeah. is a regular restaurant, such as we have, we have Alan here this evening. To know, Alan, how are you? Thank right. you for coming. Um, I, I love to interact with the guests, as a matter of fact, yeah. because it, that is the time when I really get to know what they enjoy, what they like. You right. know, for example, right. somebody really doesn't care for truffle or somebody doesn't like cucumber, I'm going to omit that for a particular dish for, for the guests. Yes, right. we cater to all, all different tastes at the right. Cunningham Grill. Well, you don't mind special requests? Not at all, no. No, I love them, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's the type of restaurant I enjoy. And just because Michael is so engaging as a person, and I've met the partners of the restaurant. It's the kind of place where you like to go sit down and enjoy your meal. You're interacting, you can talk to the chef. If you don't like the plate, just don't hit him. But you know, he's willing, he's willing to work with you, which is really great. And, and I admire you for having you know, a nice personality. Thank you. Okay. And I, I can say the same about my, my business partners as well. Both, and both Peter and George have provided us with a wonderful decor inside the restaurant. It's right. absolutely breathtaking when you step in. It's very, yeah. very nice. It's, it's incredibly quaint. Yeah, we're going to be there. We're going to shoot the interior. We're going to do the interview and let people see what a comfortable atmosphere it is. So it's great. I, I know I've been there, so uh, I can appreciate that. Very All nice. right, what are we doing next here, Chef? Well, let's start with our risotto, okay. please. Okay. So over here, this is a tiger shrimp risotto with 
mm. a nice diced asparagus, mm. and a sweet corn niblet. Mm. Now, when I make a risotto, I don't use a traditional method. I par cook the arborio rice. Now, when I par cook the arborio rice, I use the standard method. However, I only utilize roughly 50% of the water that you're going to use in a standard recipe. So that is to say, I start with a nice, high-quality imported arborio rice. Yeah. I coat it with extra virgin olive oil. Good. I place it in a large stock pot or rondeau, yeah. and then I have another large pot of boiling vegetable stock, which mm -hmm. I slowly ladle into right. the arborio rice, and right. I stir the rice. Now, right. arborio rice is a rice which is with an incredibly high starch content that mm -hmm. breaks down as you stir and slowly cook right. the rice. So I have my par-cooked arborio rice here, to which I've added poached tiger shrimp, wow. diced asparagus, and sweet corn niblets. Mm. I also add just a little bit of unsalted butter, salt, and pepper. Mm. Now it, it smells fabulous. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Yes. You're not wearing special underarm deodorant here, are you? No, it, no, sir, no, sir, no, 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 yeah. no. The food is the only aphrodisiac involved oh, today. Oh, very good, yes. very it's good. natural, all very natural. Very good. So all I do is I simmer this over medium flame yeah. until the rice cooks completely and you have just a little bit of residual liquid. You don't want to complete the reduction right, right, in the pan right. because that is going to dry out your risotto. You so, want it to be nice and yeah. moist and flavorful. Okay, you were giving a tip. Yes. When you first prepare your rice, you only use half the liquid. Half the liquid because I'm putting the other 50% in at this stage. And you're finishing the rice here. Yes, sir. Okay. So Chef just gave you a great tip. And it's similar to cooking a pasta. You don't want that pasta al dente. What you want is just before al dente, and it's the same with this rice. You want to finish it at the time you're putting your whole dish together. So keep that in mind. And what does that do for you, particularly on the rice? You can make this a couple of days in advance yeah, and just absolutely. keep it in your refrigerator. Yes, yes. Once again, if you have a, you know, a working parent coming home or just yeah. a working spouse coming home looking to make dinner for their significant other or their family, it just uh, you know, saves you a little bit of time and a few steps. Right, right. All right, so what I do is, I, like I said, I just simmer this here. I give it a few flips. This has about another minute. Yeah. And it won't be long. Right. Uh, you know, in this, I, I'm watching this, and you can see that it's absorbing this liquid, yes. which is another great tip. He's using a vegetable stock. I'll use, myself, most of the time, I'll use a chicken stock. But our co-host is vegetarian, so if I know she's going to have some, I use the vegetable stock. Excellent. And what you're doing, you're adding more flavor into that rice. Yes. It's, absor it's absorbing that flavor is what it's doing. Yes. Now, I'd like to show you one thing here, Joe. This, yeah. is, this is going to show us that our dish is almost done. Yeah. The bubbles are becoming more pronounced, right. and they're getting closer together. That's yeah. how you know that the dish is almost complete. Almost done, right. Now, at this point, I'm just going to take it off and yeah. rest it on the side. And the residual heat, sure. which is in the saute pan, is going to finish the cooking process. Right. The carryover heat is going to finish that for us. Right. So, Chef just gave you another great tip. You always have, even if you're doing a roast, a chicken, uh, pork roast, whatever, rice, you're going to have that residual cooking, all right? So you don't have to kill the, the dish in the oven on the stove. You want it to rest a few minutes, let all those flavors come together, and it's still cooking. So keep that in mind. You know, cooking is building flavors, one layer on top of each other, and this is part of the technique that Chef is giving to you. So you're giving us some great tips for the, the home viewer. So this, is, this has been a great show. All right, so. We're going to see some scallops. I'll, I'll tell you, folks, when it comes to scallops, it's all about the quality of the product. There, there are two types of scallops on today's market. One is a dry scallop. The other one is referred to as a wet scallop. Now, in, in the industry, the, you know, the, the, fishing, the fishing companies, what they'll do at times is they'll soak the scallop in a solution of trisodium phosphate and water. And what this does is it preserves the scallop and it plumps it, it. And it plumps it up so they can, sell you, they can sell you a little bit more. However, this is really not the product that you want. You want a true dry scallop because the flavor is going to be second to none, right. especially in comparison to yeah. a wet scallop. Yeah. It's going to be sweet, it's yeah. going to be rich, it's going to be delicate. And when it comes to searing, it's also going right. to sear yeah. a lot better. Right. Now, 
Now what yeah. we have here, Joe, is a 1020 dry scalp mask. Nice. Can, can you tell me what the 10 to 20 refers to? Yeah, that, that's the count, basically, how many to a pound. How many per pound. Right. Now, I want to make a point about what Chef just told you. And you've heard me talk about this a number of times in this show. And really, repetition makes a difference. And also, what's important here for me is you not only heard it from me, you've heard it from other chefs and you're hearing it from Michael. A dry scallop is your first choice. Do not be afraid to speak up at the seafood counter and say, are these dry scallops? And if they're not, my suggestion, don't buy them. You can always go someplace else. Right, yes, exactly. Absolutely. All right, chef, I'm dying to have some scallops. All right, right, let's get to it then. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to season the scallops with just a little bit of kosher salt and freshly cracked black pepper. Season mm -hmm. liberally, don't right. be afraid, just a little bit over the top. With the pepper and set them off to the side. Right. Now you've heard us talk about kosher salt, kosher or sea salt, whatever you prefer. I truly believe kosher salt has a much better flavor profile than the iodized table salt. As do I, Joe. I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I'm a firm proponent of the, yeah. okay. of the salt. Now, when it comes to searing a scallop, or pretty much any protein mm -hmm. uh, for that matter, the quality of your saute pan and the temperature at which the saute pan has reached before you add the protein right. is, comes to everything. At the Butterham Grill, we use a high quality 1810 gauge stainless wow. steel, and that's just something which can conduct the heat evenly, yeah. and it's going to be able to hold the heat while you sear your scallop. Wow. Now, one way which I like to judge the temperature of the pan, besides hitting with my hand, of course, yeah. is just to pour the oil in, right. and you want to watch the rate at which the oil moves around the pan. Yeah. Now, you see... Yeah, you're getting a little smoke there. That this, now, is, this is moving at a good rate, at a good speed. It looks almost like water does, Joe. Right. That's how I know it's ready. Now, are you using canola oil here, or what type of I am oil? using a mix of vegetable, which is predominantly canola, and extra virgin olive oil as okay, well. Okay, right. Yeah, and again, you know, when you're going to do this type, you're looking to get a nice golden sear. Yes. The olive oil, which I love to cook with myself, but it has a much lower smoke uh, point than a salad or canola oil. Yes. So we just recently saw this, the chef recommended the same thing you did, a mixture of olive oil and can, uh, a salad, canola oil. And what the point is, with that EVOO, extra yes. food, you're going to get more flavor. Much richer flavor, yes, right. full bodied. So now it appears as though our pan is ready with the oil. I'm just okay. going to go ahead and place. Yeah. The scallops in, season side down, Joe. Yeah. And you should hear a nice sizzle if I've done my job correctly. Right. Oh, that oh, sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So we're going to place it right along the edge of the pan. Yeah. You don't want there to be too much oil because, as I said, we're looking to sear, right. not deep fry. Yeah. Now, the important thing when it comes to searing a scallop is once you are confident in the temperature of your pan or the temperature of your oil, just don't touch it. Just leave it alone until you're ready to flip it. You really only want to flip the scallop one time. Right. And uh, when it comes to judging the, the degree to which the scallop has been cooked, yeah. uh, I look for two things. I look for the bounce, which we'll be able to, uh, which we'll be able to tell after we flip the scallop. And I also look for the texture or the grain of the scallop. It's almost like a piece of red meat yeah. or a piece of pork, right. where as the protein cooks, you can see the grain develop right. in the side of the scallop. And as that yeah. becomes more pronounced and more visible, that mm -hmm. way we know that the scallop is done. Right. And then you also can use the touch method. For instance, if you're cooking steak or a piece of meat, you know, I would say use the finger method. Of course. The finger to thumb. And by the time you get to the, the small finger in your thumb, that muscle is as hot as a rock. So you know, and I wouldn't recommend it for scallops. You don't want them cooked yeah. to a fairly well. But that is another technique. So it smells great. Chef. Thank you. I have some tongs. You have some tongs. Very oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. I'll utilize the tongs. And may I ask, as far as the temperature is concerned, Joe, do you... Uh, do you like to cook your scallops all the way through, or do you like to have them more on the medium rare, medium side? I like medium, medium rare. Yes. I feel that's the only way to eat. Of course. Scallops. Of course. Because it, they become like rubber if they get too hard. Some people just want it dead. 
murdered. I, I don't believe in that. But, yes, yes. You know, everybody has different tastes. So, you know, don't be afraid to tell your server. How do you serve them generally? I, I'm, I'm right there with you, Joe. I like them from medium rare right. medium. I don't like them rare. I don't like them raw, mind no. you. But I, I, I like a little bit of translucency. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't want it dried out. So. No, certainly not. But don't be afraid to speak up and tell your server. You know, I love scallops, but I want to feel like I'm chewing bubble gum. Of course. Cook yeah. them. Yeah, no, so to right. teach their own. Everybody, everybody's different. Right. Now it appears as though we've developed a, a nice crust on one side. I'm just going to start turning these scallops one at a time, Joe. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Now, one thing I can tell you about searing fish, folks, or even roasting fish on a stainless steel aluminum pan, it's going to release from the pan when it's ready. Yeah. Don't try and force it. Don't try and rush it. When, it, when, it's, when it's time for it to come off, it's going to come off. Um, fairly effortlessly, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, we have one, and we have Chef, two. Oh, look at that. Yeah, Chef did something I want to point out. He got that pan smoking hot before he put his oil in there. Yes. Okay? And I think that's a critical point. That before you put that oil in, you want that pan to be hot. And that way there, you can follow the instructions Chef gave you. Watch how that oil moves in the pan. Yes. Then you'll know that that pan is ready. Yes, so sir. those are great tips he gave you. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else, folks. There's a world of difference between having a warm pan and hot oil and having a hot pan and hot oil. Because if the pan is only warm and it's not truly hot, then the oil is going to reach a certain temperature. But as soon as you put your product in the pan, you're going to, you're going to lose that heat and you're not going to sear effectively. It's right. just not going to be right. as good. Yeah, and then he, Chef Michael just also gave you another great tip. Don't be moving stuff around. If that pan is hot enough, and once he puts his oil in there, that comes to temperature, meat, scallops, fish, it will release on its own. Yeah. So otherwise, it's going to be sticking to the pan. You're going to be pulling it apart. So don't be afraid to... You know, allow the pan to cook your product. Yes, sir. Now, once again, speaking in terms of residual heat, I've turned the flame off of our burner, and I'm yep. just going to let the scallops sit in the pan for between 45 and 60 seconds until the cooking process is complete. Excellent. Now, as you see, Joe, we have a nice caramelization, caramelization on the top, but we have that white ring around the middle of your scallop, which is really what you want, which right. is going to create a nice sear, but it's not going to overcook the inside of the scallop either. Chef just gave you a great tip. I haven't heard anybody say, talk about this before. Look for that white ring, okay? And then you know that that product is cooked to perfection. Yes. Thank you, Chef. Excellent. Great tip, yeah. Chef. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now, can we just take a fast look at your risotto? Oh, most certainly. Yeah. Uh, you see how it's come together nicely? You it, have yeah. almost a little bit of a, a gelatinous liquid there, Joe. Excellent. That's exactly what you're looking for. Right. Because underneath that gelatinous liquid, it's still rather loose. And when you stir it and bring it together right before you plate, it's going to be just perfect. Great. Wonderful. So I'm going to start with our risotto. We have some nice spoons here if you want. Oh, I'll, I'll, I like a nice spoon, Joe. Right over there. Wonderful. So together, make sure it's well combined. Yeah. It looks just perfect. I can tell just by looking at it. Right. I've done enough of this. You know, yeah, it, and it is. And it really did finish absorbing m pretty much all of that liquid, but enough to, you know, to give uh, the consistency that you're looking for. Yes. Okay. Grab our tongs once again Ooh, over here. Hot pan. There we go. So we have asbestos here, so Joe, Joe and I, we don't, we don't really feel the temperature. No. Well, no, Joe's a little delicate these That's days. He's not doing this kind of work. Yeah. But he has no problem with you with Teflon hands. Believe me. Of course. Me. Behind you, Joe. Pardon me, sir. Okay. I'm going to put that right there. We're going to rest it. Okay. Oh, my God. I've got to tell you, the aromas are fabulous. Thank you, Joe. I've been trying to find somebody that has a great technical, creative uh, intellect. We need to create smell-o-vision. And how we do that, I don't know. Someday, someday with the right. technology these days, you, you never know. Now here I just have a little bit of a creamed lobster fumé, yeah. which I'm going to drizzle over the top. Let me ask, can you, can you tell me what a, do you know what a fumé is, Joe, by yes, chance? Yes, yeah. 
Fumé is used to enhance a stock. For instance, if you have, a, a, let's say, a quart of lobster stock. Well, you may want to enhance that flavor, so you will take a half a quart and do a reduction. And when you do a reduction, it's building flavor, okay? And it helps that finished product so that you're getting the flavor that you're looking for. And fumé is a French term. I think the correct pronunciation, not that I speak French, is fumet. And, but it's spelled F-U-M-E-T. Yes, sir. But it, it really will add to your finished dish because if, if it's a lobster, for instance, as Chef has made, you're going to get a great flavor of lobster in there. Okay. Uh, if I may, I'm just going to finish it with a touch of aged balsamic and Ooh. white truffle oil as well. Get the hook. Which he, we have this it right guy over is here. incredible. Upton hook. We have it right over here. So right now we just have a, a standard white truffle oil. I prefer the white truffle oil. I think it's, it's a little bit deeper and richer in flavor, a little okay. more effervescent. Great. Just a little bit because it is rather pungent. Uh, and I, I will say that you don't want to overdo it with the truffle because once you add it, you just really can't go back. Right. And this is, this is something which you make at the grill. This is a 10-hour aged balsamic reduction. Wow. I start with a high-quality aged balsamic, yeah. and then I cook it slowly over a double boiler for Sweet. about 9 or 10 hours. Wow. And it just comes out wonderful. It has a tremendous flavor, and you yeah. see the body that it has as well. Right. And what he's done is he's taken a lot of the liquid out of there so that you're getting almost a syrup consistency. Exactly. But again... It's like the fumé, it's a reduction, so you, that flavor is profile is going to really enhance the dish. So don't be afraid to do a reduction, particularly with the balsamic. I mean, it's so pretty, it adds so much to the eating experience. So great job, chef, really great. Now, did you bring dessert? Not, not today, perhaps okay. next time we'll do a nice chocolate espresso okay. creme brulee or something. Thank like you. Very good. Very good. Well, we want to thank Puttingham Grill and Chef Michael. And in closing, I want to thank the Sons of Italy Lodge in Roslindale. They've been very gracious in allowing us to shoot our show here. And we'd also like to thank Fornax uh, Bakery, which is an artisan bread company, and they supply the bread as well for the show. So in closing, again, Chef, this has been a great, instructional, informative, and engaging show, which is what we like. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Joe. It's okay. been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, chef owner at Chiara Bistro Westwood with this week's chef's tip. Uh, this week I just wanted to talk about brining. Now brining is very popular around Thanksgiving time where people always ask me should I brine my turkey or not. I always say yes, it doesn't hurt the product, but it's also very popular year round where you can use it for pork ribs, pork loins, tenderloins. Uh, this particular brine I'm going to show you is very well suited for poultry and pork. Brining can actually never hurt a product. It, it is done for a couple of reasons. One is to add moisture to it, which it does do, but more importantly it does add a flavor. Uh, so when brining turkey breasts here, I'm going to show you a simple four ingredient brine that can be used for turkey. It's also delicious with pork, uh, pork loin or pork tenderloins. And then the question always is how long should I brine the product? Uh, it really depends on the size of, of the product. If it's a whole turkey of brining, and you, these are easily multiplied, these ingredients. Um, you know, then I would probably look at something about, like about 18 hours um, to 24 hours, but something as simple as a pork tenderloin that's only maybe weighs a pound, six hours, four to six hours is sufficient for that. So the ingredients for the brine here, and these are just proportional, they're very easily multiplied. If you need to make more or less, you can either do the multiplication, cut it down, or add to it. So I'm going to start with a quart of chicken stock. And 
rather than using salt, now I know a lot of people use kosher salt in brines, and I've heard from people, one of my customers just told me, oh, I brined a turkey and it was extremely salty. Uh, rather than salt, I like to use soy sauce because it will give you the sodium uh, require, you know, that's required in brining. Um, but at the same time, this will help to add a nice rich brown color to the, to the finished product. So I'm going to do two cups of soy sauce, one cup of a really good grade A maple syrup, and then a half cup of dark molasses which is left out of room temp because you know the old cold molasses saying. Okay, and it's really that simple. So it's four ingredients. You're going to whisk that together and you just pour this over, over your pork tenderloin, your pork ribs, whatever meat or poultry that you're trying to flavor. And it's that simple. Uh, now this would do probably like three to four or five pounds of pork. If you were doing a whole turkey, you might want to double this recipe. And if you're doing just a couple of pork tenderloins, you might want to cut it in half. But none of the ingredients are too expensive. Brining is a very inexpensive way to add flavor. And hopefully you'll be trying that. And try it before you grill some items, too. It really adds that extra dimension of flavor. Thanks for watching. That's this week's tip. Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table Series Restaurant Interview. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host, and I am here at Parnaham Grill located at 1012 West Roxbury Parkway in Chestnut Hill in Parnaham Circle. I am here with Executive Chef and Co-Owner Michael Hinsman. So Michael, thanks for being on the show with me today. Thank you for having me. You and Joe did a great job cooking that excellent pan-seared scallops oh, and risotto. Wonderful so too. much yes. fun. So tell me, how did you get started in the restaurant industry? I've always had an interest with uh, pairing flavors and combining different ingredients mm -hmm. to just create uh, something wonderful either myself or someone oh. else can enjoy. Yep. Um, as far as my professional career is concerned, I, I started out um, tossing up salads and decorating, like decorating dessert plates at a, at a nice restaurant oh. on the North Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, I advanced to the different stations on the line, such as the grill. Um, oven and, yep. and saute. Um, uh, my next step was a, was a wonderful restaurant in Amherst, Massachusetts where I wow. gained experience as a sous chef. Uh, I had the opportunity to create specials and express myself creatively. Um, it was a, a bustling location. It's called <laughs> Judy's in Amherst. Uh, I don't wow. think I've ever seen anything like it. Uh, yeah. The amount of volume which is, um, which is executed in, in that location is mm -hmm. just, uh, it's just phenomenal. I also have a good amount of experience uh, in the front of the house, uh, front of the house management, managing pizzerias, um, you know, waiting on tables, um, uh, being a function server, working as a, a banquet chef, a function chef. Michael, you did it all. Pretty you much, yes. Yeah. No, I've, I've been, yeah. been, there, been there and done that, however. We're always looking forward uh, to something new mm -hmm. and, and trying to find something interesting to give the folks of Chestnut Hill. Wow. Yes. So your word was creative, and I find that a lot of chefs come into this because they're so creative, and they come up with their own um, culinary meals and dishes. So what type of food can people find here at Punnaham Grill? If I were to sum up what we have here at the Putterham yep. Grill, I'd mm -hmm. say it's comfort food with a little bit of class and style, Ooh. I guess you could say. I like that. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I provide nothing but the highest quality product that I keep tremendously fresh, mm -hmm. and as you said, I'm, I'm not afraid to get uh, creative uh, right. with the product. Uh, uh, for my lunch menu, I have uh, a wonderful homemade chicken soup, oh. a real chicken soup. It's a four-hour chicken the stock which I prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, a real oven-roasted turkey breast. I have a wonderful top-choice roast beef. Uh, we have a fantastic all-white meat chicken salad and albacore tuna mm -hmm. salad. Uh, we have tremendously fresh salads, uh, a garden Greek Caesar caprice. I also have uh, a salad which I created myself. I mm -hmm. call it a roasted beet salad, which is oh, baby, love beets. Uh, as, as do I, particularly when they're paired with goat cheese. I find mm -hmm. that's the key. They go well together. Yes. In this particular salad, I use baby arugula with diced red beets, uh, crumbled goat cheese, julienne Bartlett pear, uh, sliced strawberry, and we finish it with a raspberry balsamic vinaigrette. Oh, and wow. it is just tremendous. Oh. 
but as I said, we're, we're always doing something different, yeah. something interesting. Mm -hmm. I, uh, today for a lunch special, I have a wonderful fried sea scallop and tiger shrimp with a chipotle citrus aioli served with wow. a baby arugula salad of mandarin orange and toasted almond mm -hmm. with just a drizzle of extra virgin mm -hmm. olive oil, a little bit of salt and pepper. Um, this evening I have a wonderful lobster bisque on my menu as well as a pan roasted chicken breast with a butternut squash and sweet potato puree, wow. a cranberry apple butter demi glace, mm -hmm. uh, glazed carrots and a string beans almondine. Uh, wow. I also have a, a very nice grilled pork loin with mm -hmm. a sesame ginger reduction, uh, portobello mushroom risotto, um, buttered broccoli florette. So you get, you get the picture. Yeah. Uh, uh, the sky's the limit and I really don't hold myself to any um, parameters or boundaries when it comes to creating the specials. Right. It just has to be fresh and, and delicious. Yeah, well after all those descriptions, I think you'll have a lot of people coming here Certainly for lunch. So. And now you also serve dinner, correct? Yes, yes. Yep. Uh, we have a fresh homemade pasta with mm -hmm. a, a, a wonderful authentic homemade marinara sauce to oh, offer everybody. The, best. the The best fish is just sauce. tremendous. All the fish mm -hmm. is just top notch. I have a fantastic baked haddock with a sherry citrus stuffing that we serve over a summer squash risotto with braised asparagus. My, wow. my lemon balsamic salmon just, oh, it just melts in I love mouth. salmon. Yes, love uh, it. As, as do I. It's just a, a wonderful, wonderful product. Right, exactly. Um, yes. Now, tell me how many seats are in here. This is a very like, cozy, you know, very pretty room in here. We can, it, depending upon how many individuals are seated at each table, mm -hmm. it's between 55 and 60. Wow, that's uh, a lot. As our maximum capacity, yes. Yep. Wow. Now, you're also busy with catering, because I noticed like before we we set up here, there was like so much catering. You do a lot of catering business, correct? Oh, we do a tremendous catering production mm -hmm. each and every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we, do, we put out anywhere between, i say, five and 15 jobs on wow. the average, which range from a continental breakfast yep. with uh, a nice fresh fruit display, maybe some home-baked muffins, mm -hmm. uh, an organic Greek yogurt uh, with a granola, maybe some chocolate chips, fresh blueberries oh, and raspberries. Oh, people love chocolate chips. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I also make a very nice chicken kebab, mm -hmm. a grilled chicken kebab finished with a pan-seared pepper and onion, mm -hmm. sherry port reduction, sautéed grape tomato, tomato, a little bit of roasted garlic oil. You're making me hungry. <laughs> so, okay, my last question, which I ask a lot of the chefs, and I'm wondering if you're going to be able to answer it, yes. is what are your top three ingredients? One of my top three yeah. ingredients, I would say, whatever is fresh okay. in the season. I, cook, I like to cook with the seasons. Okay. And if I'm at the market, uh, the produce market, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still pick up the produce myself oh. uh, between six and seven days a week so mm -hmm. I can assure the quality. If I don't particularly care for the way the romaine lettuce looks, I'm going to utilize a red leaf or a green leaf lettuce, mm -hmm. which I'll note on my special sheet uh, for the day. So it's, it's whatever I have available mm -hmm. to me from a particular market or purveyor right. that's of the highest of the Right, highest and per quality. day, I'm sure it changes per day, yes. what you're going to make. Yes. Perfect. Well, Michael, thanks so much for being in the restaurant interview segment with me. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to come here for brunch, lunch, and dinner after all those descriptions. Love to have you. We have some of the, some of the best, best omelets that you'll encounter. Right. And your brunch on Sundays, 11 to 4? 11 to 4, Perfect. yes. Oh, that's yes, great. Awesome. Well, I wish you all the luck. Now, you've been here how many years? We've been here three and a half years. Three and a half years. Three and a half years, And yes. you're going strong. Going strong. That's, Still building. As that's a awesome. Fact, yes. Perfect. All right. So everyone, this has been the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor here at Pineham Grill, and we'll see you next week. On a stainless steel aluminum pan, it's going to release from the pan when it's ready. Don't try and force it. Don't try and rush it. When, it, when, it's, when it's time for it to come off, it's going to come off fairly effortlessly, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Chef. Oh, look at that. This, yeah. is, this is something which you make at the grill. This is a 10 hour aged balsamic reduction. Wow. I start with a high quality aged balsamic, yeah. and then I cook it slowly over a double boiler for Sweet. about nine or 10 hours, wow. and it just comes out wonderful. It has a tremendous flavor, and yeah. you see the body that it has as well. Right, and what he's done is he's